Greetings, this is Dyslexi from the Arma Community Group, Shack Tactical. In cooperation with Bohemia Interactive, I'm creating a series of videos that explain some of the basics of Arma 3. Today, we're looking at aspects of jet employment in Arma, based on the many platform improvements that have been introduced through the Jets DLC. In the context of Arma, jets tend to serve two primary purposes, supporting units on the ground, or interdicting enemy aircraft that are attempting to support their own units on the ground. The former is the domain of close air support aircraft, while the latter involves air superiority fighters. There are dedicated close air support aircraft such as the A-164 Wipeout, which has a limited capacity to defend itself against aerial threats, but a robust set of armaments available for ground attack. Many platforms, like the Buzzard, act as multi-role and can do either close support or anti-air work. Multi-role fighters like the Black Wasp, Shikra, and Griffin excel at defeating enemy aerial threats but can also carry ground attack munitions when the situation calls for it. The munition types you'll tend to find can be broken down into two basic categories, air to ground and air to air. Air to air comes in two primary forms, infrared and radar guided. Infrared missiles have passive detection and guidance, meaning that they're harder for an enemy to detect that they're being locked onto or engaged. Radar guided missiles give more warning to the enemy due to their active guidance. The radar pulses being sent out by the missile or aircraft give away that they're locking or tracking. Infrared missiles have shorter engagement ranges, while radar missiles can be used from significantly longer range. Air to ground has a greater variety of munitions due to the broader range of potential targets involved, such as infantry, vehicles, or structures. For infantry and lighter vehicles, folding fin aerial rockets, or FFARs, are an effective area weapon. FFARs come in pods of multiple rockets, and although they're unguided, they can be fired with fair accuracy from several kilometers away thanks to the presence of a continually calculated impact point on the heads-up display. Heavier vehicles such as tanks are the domain of anti-tank guided missiles, or ATGMs. These can lock on from kilometers away and will accurately guide to their target and generally knock it out in a single good hit. Bombs can be used against any kind of target, though they work best at destroying structures or clusters of targets. Bombs are available in either guided or unguided varieties. Guided bombs can be employed through self-designation or by having a unit on the ground or another aircraft provide the laser spot for tracking. Unguided bombs can be fairly accurately employed via the CCIP on the HUD. Finally, an aircraft's cannon can be used for both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground roles. Some aircraft, like the Wipeout, have powerful cannons capable of defeating armored threats with large ammo capacities. Others have lighter cannons with less ammo, while some aircraft don't even have integral cannons and instead must mount an external cannon if they want to have that capacity. Deciding what to bring to a mission is now possible thanks to dynamic loadouts. If you're expecting to be facing down tanks primarily, leaving out some rocket pods in order to bring along more anti-tank guided missiles is a real possibility. Whereas if you're a fighter that doesn't plan to worry about ground threats, packing extra air-to-air -air missiles is a wise choice to make. These loadout choices have ramifications beyond just what targets you're able to engage, as including external stores can lessen the protective stealth attributes of otherwise stealthy aircraft. When maximum stealth is desired, selecting an aircraft with internal-only stores can help to keep the radar cross-section as small as possible. In order to engage targets, you must find them in the first place, and the JETS DLC introduces an entirely new sensor system to facilitate this. There are now three core types of sensors, radar, infrared, and visual. Each sensor type has its own range and scanning arc, indicated on the sensor panel as different colored arcs. Cyan for active radar, green for passive, yellow for visual, red for infrared. To bring up these info panels, simply use the open and close bracket keys by default. Radar comes in two forms. You have active radar, where your aircraft is actively sending out pulses, and passive radar, where it's simply detecting radar pulses from other sources. Active radar can be toggled on and off, on demand, as the situation necessitates, via left control plus R and Arma 3's default key bindings. Think of it like being in an enormous dark room with a flashlight. When you turn on your radar or flashlight, you can see wherever the beam shines. Anyone else in the room who keeps their own flashlight off, representing passive radar, will see yours, but you won't see them unless you happen to shine your beam at them. The Wipeout is an example of an aircraft that doesn't have active radar capabilities, but does have a passive radar warning receiver. Radar has some limitations. It's easy to see a fast-moving vehicle against the sky background, 
whereas something moving with ground clutter behind it will be harder to detect, even more so if it's moving slowly. Infrared sensors work off of detecting the heat radiating from an object. These will work better against objects that are hotter, so while you might have trouble detecting something that only recently turned on, well-heated objects will be readily detected. Infrared is a passive sensor technology such that you don't need to worry about controlling emissions from it like with radar, since the enemy won't know that you're using it. Finally, visual sensors work off of detecting shapes and contrast. Like infrared, they're passive sensors, but unlike infrared, their usability is heavily dependent on the time of day. A visual sensor is nearly useless once night falls. A few other sensors deserve noting. Night vision detectors can be used to pick up infrared strobes, while laser designation detectors are used to acquire laser locks for laser-guided ordnance. Some vehicles have special infrared sensors tuned for detecting human targets at short range. Keep in mind that there are two areas sensors can be present. One is on the aircraft itself, while the other is in any given weapon mounted to the aircraft. Many aircraft have a sensor system that the pilot can use to search for targets, as well as self-designate for laser-guided munitions. The sensor will often have multiple vision modes, potentially including both night vision and thermal imaging, making it possible to detect targets more readily than otherwise. The pilot camera sensor allows for ground stabilization and target tracking, making it possible to keep eyes on the target in great detail while still maneuvering. Some aircraft and other vehicles have the capability to share their targets through a data link system. When this is in use, a data link capable vehicle will have contacts seen by other similarly data link equipped vehicles show up on their sensor, allowing for battlefield awareness. This can make it possible for a vehicle like a ground radar system to feed information to jets, or for a jet with better sensors to feed that info back to less well equipped jets. Using a stealth UCAV as an advanced warning asset can become a viable tactic as a result. The most significant threat a jet will face in ARMA involves dedicated anti-aircraft vehicle systems. These are autocannon equipped vehicles complete with a set of anti-aircraft missiles and are used as short-range air defense. The upside of these is that they utilize active radar detection, making them show up on radar warning receivers when they're searching for targets, and their size and need for clear lines of sight place restrictions on where they can go. More difficult to detect are Man Portable Air Defense Systems, or Man Pads. These missile launchers can be carried by individual troops and can pose significant hazards to low-flying jets. Man Pads utilize passive guidance in the form of infrared sensors, meaning that you won't know when a launcher is about to engage you. Aside from ground-based systems, other aircraft can be significant sources of concern. Enemy jets, particularly ones which are more air-to-air -air focused on what you might be flying, require special care to defeat. Even enemy helicopters can pose dramatic threats, as they can equip similar air-to-air -air missiles as jets and have many benefits from being able to operate at treetop level as well as hover, making it easy for them to disappear into ground clutter. Defensive sensors include the Radar Warning Receiver, or RWR, which gives awareness of enemy radar transmitters, and the Missile Approach Warning Sensor, which lets you know when a missile has been detected as being launched at your aircraft. The RWR can differentiate between whether a radar is tracking your aircraft or not, or whether it's locked on, and the MAW will let you know once a missile is in the air and what direction it's coming from. An orange arc indicates a target locking onto you, while a red one shows a direction a missile is approaching from. The defense against these sorts of missiles is to employ chaff and flare countermeasures and attempt to beam the missile by flying a path perpendicular to it. This gives the missile the hardest tracking solution, requiring it to continually adjust its flight path to attempt to intercept. When dealing with autocannon and similar ground fire, the best tactic is to fly erratically and attempt to outrange the weapon system or mask behind terrain or similar. Improvements to the aircraft damage models mean that you're now able to take more varied kinds of damage before the vehicle is completely destroyed. Hits to the engines can compromise their power output or disable them entirely. Fuel hits can cause leaks to drain fuel rapidly, while hits to the control surfaces, the ailerons, elevators, and rudders, can reduce maneuverability, increase drag, and otherwise disrupt stable flight. Ejection seats are represented now, making it easier to get yourself clear of the aircraft when bailing out becomes a necessity. When it comes to air-to-air -to -air tactics, managing radar emissions and cultivating and maintaining stealth are two of the biggest factors. Infrared missiles make it possible to engage targets at closer ranges without being seen, while stealth can make it possible to get into that range in the first place. Air-to-ground tactics are oriented around getting through enemy air defenses, making a strike, and getting back to safety. 
When the airspace is contested, terrain following flight can be used to stay under enemy radar systems with a pop-up being used near the target to gain altitude, identify the target, roll in and strike it, then return to low altitude for the flight back out. When the airspace is less contested, jets can loiter at higher altitudes using their pilot camera to identify targets while safely out of the range of enemy small arms fire. As with all things, practice is essential. Strap in, burn some holes in the sky, and you'll rapidly find yourself climbing to a whole new style of aerial gameplay. For more community guide videos, be sure to subscribe to the official Arma 3 YouTube channel. For other Arma 3 updates, keep track of the official website, Facebook, and Twitter pages. If you'd like more in-depth tutorial and multiplayer gameplay of Arma 3, I'd recommend you check out my channel here. This is Dyslexi, and until next time, take care.